Witness on the last call. I'm a research analyst at TD. I cover Canadian and U.S. Uh, listed energy royalties. With us for this 20-minute discussion, we have Tom McLean. He's president and CEO of uh, Freehold Royalties. I have a handful of questions that I think are interesting. Hopefully you think they're interesting, but if you have questions, feel free to enter them in the text box on the left-hand side of the screen. You just type in your question, and I'll ask Tom on your behalf. Uh, we'll start out this panel by allowing Tom to speak several minutes about uh, key takeaways he sees um, in his business, or he wants you to take away from his business, and then we'll jump into a more targeted Q&A. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tom. Tom, could you provide us just an overview of key takeaways that you want uh, investors to walk away with? Yeah, thanks, Aaron, uh, and good morning, and thank you for TD uh, for inviting us to this conference. Um, I think uh, as a royalty company uh, in the energy space, um, you know, some of the key takeaways is um, that uh, as a royalty company, you know, we have very high margins, as you know. Um, you know, we had a really great first quarter well, coming into this COVID here, I mean, we had you know 10,600 BUEs plus uh, a day in our royalty production. Our production had grown 5% year over year, 3% quarter over quarter, and on the liquid side, it had increased 7% year over year. So we we entered this uh, downturn in, in very good shape, and our assets have outperformed the basin over the last uh, number of years. Last year, in 2019, when the drilling was down 25%, uh, we were pretty much flat, down 2% on, on drilling on our lands. We've, in the last uh, five to seven years, we've positioned ourselves in the best assets in the basin, and we believe that these assets will see capital at a faster rate and will return to drilling um, faster than uh, the basin average. But when we came into the COVID times here and prices crashed uh, in early March, um, we took care of what we could control. Uh, we reduced our uh, g and uh, by 15% uh, for my, myself and for the board. Um, and we also um, you know, re reduced our, our dividend, as everybody know by, knows, by 71%. Uh, in the backdrop at that time, we were looking at Q2 pricing uh, in the 20s for WTI. Um, we, we cut uh, fairly severely um, with uh, not a lot of uh, guidance on where the world would be. Still a little murky. We're glad the oil price is back up into the 40s uh, here. And we think we, in, the, in our, uh, you know, our portfolio, um, we will see the drilling come back Specifically, I think in the Viking first, uh, southeast Saskatchewan, um, and then the Clearwater. As prices move uh, you know, a little bit north and sustain in the uh, 40s, we think they'll be drilling in the back half of the year. After really good Q1, a poor Q2, Q3, we think uh, Q4 will be a, a good quarter for us and set us up for, uh, for next year. Yeah, also, uh, you know, we believe the, the, our share price obviously is, is um, undervalued. Um, we don't have the capital commitments that uh, producers have. Uh, myself and the chair both uh, bought meaningful positions in this downturn here. I just bought 30,000 shares myself. Uh, we think that, uh, you know, we are a great model. We have returned um, and had great returns over a number of years and will continue to do so and we're continue continue to be undervalued right now, um, but um, I think our model will sustain itself and show um, the, how resilient it is uh, in, in this downturn. So I'll turn it over to questions uh, now, Aaron. Sure. Um, you, you touched on it briefly in your opening remarks, but you alluded to the fact that uh, activity on freehold land last year materially exceeded the averages that we saw across the basin. What do you attribute that to? Like, what is it about freeholds, lands, or plays that resulted in it seeing more capital or more activity than the basin average? Yeah, I mean, I guess there's a couple things. One is the play types themselves. The other thing is, um, you know, 70% of the drilling in our land last year was from privates, um, not um, don't have the you know the ups and downs that the public markets have, um, and don't have that immediate. Um, I mean, I guess uh, you know 
pressures that the, the public market has. And so we think that the, the privates will return to drilling uh, sooner than some of the publics. Uh, yeah, those comments were echoed by Andrew Phillips on the previous call. On the private side, um, do you feel as though um, there's anything you can do to enhance their um, ability to spend more, whether it's incentivize exploration that um, some of the public companies may be hesitant to do, or incentivize um, any company to drill more by adjusting the royalty rate? Yeah, maybe. Um, so for this one, uh, you know, as, as far as incentivizing producers, um, we have looked at um, a number, of, a, a few deals. We haven't do, haven't done very many so far, but we have done a couple of deals where we have, uh, you know, cut uh, on uh, the initial well in a uh, in a section to develop a play. We've also uh, looked at, um, you know, uh, commitments on drilling uh, to incentivize. Um, you know, it's, uh, activity in our land, but it, we haven't done a lot of those, Aaron. We have only done uh, a couple handful of those at this point. Okay. Um, just turning to Q2, um, general industry um, downturn. Third-party shut-ins were obviously a legitimate concern of yours and mine, and a risk to Q2. Um, could you talk a little bit about what you actually saw? For shut-ins in Q2 relative to your expectations, and by what magnitude you've seen um, volumes being restored as the commodity prices recovered? Yeah, so I mean, I guess uh, June numbers aren't in, but uh, you know, we saw about a 10% shut-in in April and 15% in May. Um, we had thought those would be in the 20-25% range uh, when we uh, forecast and cut our dividend. Um, so it, we haven't seen as much shut-ins as we thought we'd have. Um, the little bit of production that we have in North Dakota, a lot of that's shut in today. And when you made your rather steep dividend adjustment um, during the quarter, uh, you were obviously considering uh, a higher magnitude of shut-ins that actually than actually happened. How should we think about your dividend going forward? Um, and your payout ratio range historically, you've had a targeted payout ratio of 60 to 80 percent. Under strip pricing, you're significantly below that. How do, how do we think about the dividend? Yeah, I mean, I guess when we look at this year's payout ratio, um, you know, we uh, our payout ratios is, is uh, between 60 and 80 percent, as you know. Um, we are well above that in the first two quarters. We'll be well underneath that, perhaps in the next two quarters. Uh, and so we will average in the low 60s for payout ratio. So that's right in where we'd like to be right now. Um, and you know, as we look into you know net 2021, um, you know we will make adjustments. But uh, we don't have any line of sight on 2021 right now. Um, but that'll come further in the year. I guess a related question: When you think about that 60 to 80 percent payout ratio range. Do you think about that on a trailing basis or a forward-looking basis under, say, a strip pricing scenario? Yeah, you know, I mean, we review our payouts on a quarterly basis, but we kind of look at it at a yearly kind of chunk. And so when we look at uh, 2020 here, you know, at the low 60s payout, we're very comfortable. Um, it allows us to have a little excess free cash flow uh, to buy some acquisitions in a low period where, you know, producers are looking for a little bit of help to stimulate activity. When we think about that free cash flow, say that uh, under strip pricing, say through Q3 and Q4, how do you think about using the difference in free cash flow between your um, current dividend payout ratio and that targeted 60 to 80 percent range? Um, what do you do with the excess cash flow through the end of this year? So debt repayment, NCIB, um, tuck in acquisitions. Like, how do you prioritize those options? Yeah, when you look at our, you know, the number one thing for us is we're pretty much a flow-through vehicle, and so on an 80, 60 to 80 percent payout ratio, we use a lot of our our cash flow um, as dividends. So number one is, is dividends. Uh, number two uh, would be um, we look at um, acquisitions to enhance our portfolio. You know, one of the reasons we outperformed the basin uh, last year uh, is because of the acquisitions we've done in the last five to seven years. And so when we buy acquisitions and improve the quality of our, our portfolio, 
um, it strengthens us. So um, number one, dividends. Number two, acquisitions. And then, you know, by default, we can't find anything that's accretive. We always look at, um, you know, acquisitions uh, versus buying back our shares um, because we are tremendously over undervalued right now. And so we do look at that with any kind of acquisition that we do. Um, you know, and so that's something that we, by default, we pay down our debt um, if we don't do any acquisitions that are accretive. And then, you know, coming into the strategy session here in the fall, we're going to discuss, you know, NCIBs, et cetera, in, you know, because we are so undervalued right now. How would you describe the uh, current M&A market? Are there um, a handful of opportunities that are presenting themselves as a result of the downturn or tight equity and credit markets? Or are producers reluctant to sell uh, royalties um, at, the, at the sort of what's perceived as to be the bottom of the cycle? Yeah, I mean, I guess in the first, I mean, I think the way the, um, when COVID hit and the downturn hit, I think uh, a lot of producers were just, uh, you know, just trying to, you know, look at liquidity um, is their number one concern. Now that we've seen, you know, 40s uh, into a pricing environment where the producers can get out and start drilling, they're looking at opportunities to uh, fund that since the equity markets are, are pretty tight right now are non-existent for a lot of producers. Um, they are looking for um, other ways to finance, and we're seeing a little a pickup in, in interest in creating royalties to fund some uh, development. And when you look at the broader um, spectrum of acquisition opportunities out there, are you currently seeing things that are call it comparable quality to uh, Freehold's existing asset base at lower valuation or um, potentially better quality at the same valuation? Well, I mean, I guess when we do uh, acquisitions, they have to be accretive. So um, they have to be uh, a better quality than our existing base. And what we do look for is putting our capital uh, in front of, you know, the industry capital. So when we put uh, money into a play, it has to be one of these plays that gets, uh, you know, first drilled as we come out of this. Interesting. It do you feel as though that's a, a slight um, uh, change or um, a, a, a slightly different strategy than Freehold operated in the past, um, where historically when you backfilled with acquisitions that were historically funded by your drip, you were essentially backfilling production and cash flow? Or have you always looked to buy in front of the drill bit? Well, you know, when when we... <sighs> I guess, you know, back to what I said earlier, I mean, we have bought quality uh, acquisitions. Uh, we have bought uh, in play types that will uh, see capital at these lower prices. Uh, so that that is, by default, um, you know, better acquisitions, um, a better, you know, improving our, our quality of our, um, our portfolio. And we're glad that we did those acquisitions that we've done over the last uh, five to seven years. Now, have we changed the way we, we do acquisitions? No, they have to make us a better company. Okay. Um, obviously, Tourmaline is talking more and more about its privately held royalty company, uh, Topaz, which has a slightly different model than the existing royalty um, options that are out there in the public market. And by that, I mean they have um, upstream royalty revenue, but they also have a component based on midstream um, infrastructure and take or pay commitments on midstream assets. Um, yesterday on our, in our panels, some producers who would have been reluctant in the past to sell uh, midstream take-or-pay contracts as a financial um, vehicle uh, suggested they were open to it. Is this something that you would look at um, potentially adding to the portfolio, or do you view yourself as a pure royalty um, company? That's a very good question. We're we're asked that, Aaron. But uh, you know, it's it's hard enough to be a royalty company and try to compete in a business of midstreamers where it's very competitive as well. I think that's just a different learning set for us, and that's not something we jump into right away. Um, somebody asked on the previous panel about um, Prairie Sky's openness or willingness to um, enter uh, the renewable space, given the increased focus on ESG. How do you how do you think about entering um, renewables or doing gross overriding royalty type contracts on renewable assets? 
Yeah, when we look at, you know, we part of our strategy session, we are going to take a look at renewables. We've already started a, a little bit of initiative there. Um, I think one of the challenges on the renewables is that it is a it is a fairly competitive world. What you do have, you have to be large enough so you have to negotiate with governments as far as setting a return, in my mind. Um, but the those are kind of big projects, and that's something that we couldn't be, we could be a part of, but we couldn't be the prime financier for. I think where our world might be is somewhere halfway between renewables and, and energy, like oil and gas, is where we can have some kind of renewable aspect uh, to an oil or, or gas or a fossil fuel kind of development. But we haven't figured out where we could land on that, but we're looking at it. Okay. Um, just staying on the M&A type uh, front, do the challenges with Dakota Access motivate you to look outside of North Dakota for potential U.S. Action, a a acquisitions, or are you still quite focused on acquiring and expanding your position in North Dakota? You know, I mean, I think this is pretty new. I, I know that the, um, you know, the, the DAPL might set back that for another 13 months or so, is, is one analyst I read. And, you know, it, it means the takeaway uh, will be a little more expensive on a discount to WTI. Probably in the, you know, when what was been in the $1 or $2 range is probably in the 4 to $6 range. So we'd have to factor that into our operators' uh, economics when we, um, we look at things. We did invest in the North Dakota because it had an 8 to 9 percent growth rate over the last number of years. Obviously, that's going to be somewhat um, muted now. <laughs> um, and so we would look to invest in North Dakota where, and that would be surgical, where areas, you know, certain sections might be developed uh, on near term. And so we wouldn't look at something that would be a broad, you know, would have to you know, have to have broad increase in production on that 8%, 8 to 9%, but localized increase in production. So we'd be pretty surgical there, but we're still looking at North Dakota. Okay. Um, shifting gears from M&A to more uh, the financial side of the business, if we look at the royalty landscape across North America, these royalty companies have a range of balance sheet leverage. Some have essentially zero. Others have as much as four turns uh, of debt on the balance sheet. What's the ideal leverage ratio for freehold? Call it under a strip pricing scenario. Yeah, I mean, I guess we entered this COVID at 0.9 times a debt to cash flow, and so uh, that's probably we're pretty comfortable there. Obviously, when your when your um, cash flow reduces dramatically as oil moves from 60 to 20 to 40, you know, it's um. um it's better to have low debt than it is to have high debt, obviously. Uh, but one one time one turn in debt is where we're comfortable. Okay. Um, I, kind of a, a strange question, but you operate through a management agreement with a private um, pension-backed entity. Uh, could you maybe talk about um, what the benefits, if any, there are to public equity shareholders of freehold by um, having this sort of uh, joint management agreement? Well, one of the things that, uh, you know, when, when C, CN um, ID is our largest shareholder at 21%, have been a very solid um, a shareholder, participated in all our raises in the last 10 years. So uh, it is always nice to have a lead um, in these things um, when, when I guess when markets come back to, uh, to growth mode. But it's always great to have a number one supporter, um, and we have that, and so that's the advantage of that. One of the other advantages is that we do have a win. We, as a you know, a pure play royalty company, we do have other assets that have a really good window into the um, the capital world and how that's uh, affecting things. So it's nice to have that as well. So having a, a solid backer like CN has been. Uh, who has been supportive over 24 years history is, is a very good thing to have. Okay. Well, 20 minutes goes by pretty quickly, Tom. Um, 